Guys, and welcome to your daily devotional series on Isaiah. It's good to have you all tuned in today. Um, this is Saturday. I don't normally do these on Saturday. I've missed the last couple of days because, as I said, the last time I was on here, uh, my Wi-Fi was giving me problems. Um, that was a challenging time at home with my entire family, four kids, and the Wi-Fi wasn't working. It was challenging for so many reasons. Um, we decided to put this in the attic and it seems they've worked better at the minute. So we're, yeah, we're, we're actually, I heard my family saying we all prayed about it. So listen, little or large things in life, it felt like a large thing. It sounds like a small thing, but praying about everything. So I was glad to hear my wife and my son both say that they were praying about this because I certainly was as well. Anyway, it's good to get back. And today we're going to cover Isaiah 13. Before I start, just wanted to say, um, as I often do, that we're in the middle of a, a crisis, a crisis throughout the world. We see in the news, we see all around us at the minute, completely, you know the word, unprecedented COVID-19. And, you know, today we're seeing lots of, it, it's definitely hitting home more now. When you see all the news with it around the UK, when you see the death total every day, when you see lots of personal stories of healthcare staff that have died from this, people who had no underlying health conditions. Um, again, uh, you know, it's not about being pessimistic or optimistic. This is the reality. Some people are suffering. And again, it's good for us to know. And I'm certainly praying most days, just mainly for the UK and those who are suffering really on our shores here. Um, and even here, just in Northern Ireland, obviously part of the UK. So yeah, praying for that at the minute. So uh, I'm praying just hopefully, as I always say, Hopefully, I've had a I've had a tough day today. I'm not sure why. Just a few different little things have been troubling my mind, and maybe just even cabin fever. I've been stuck in the house. Just felt a bit, a bit less inspired than maybe I normally would. And um, I was sitting down earlier, and I kind of thought, why do I feel uninspired? And and, and I mean, I'll be honest, it was it was thinking about the Word of God that pulled me through. It was thinking about God's Word. Yes, communicating it and sharing my ideas from it but just God's word that pulled me through and I don't know how many times in my life I can say that but I do hope God's word is pulling you through right now and when I say God's word I'm saying God's word because it's his spoken revelation to us it's the way he communicates to us it's the same in relationships um, it's that memory of something that a partner has said to you or something a relative has said to you in a dark moment that was what their words that came through your mind, that said to you, that maybe lifted your spirits. I do hope God's word saying that to you at the moment as well. Um, today's title from Isaiah 13 um, is surprisingly good news. Um, surprisingly good news. Um, I'm going to share something that God said that will not sound like good news, but to me, and I'm going to talk about two reasons why it is actually good news from Isaiah 13. If you've got there before me, and you've read Isaiah 13, you're reading it and thinking, you may want to skip this one because there's a lot of talk about judgment, a lot of talk about what God will do to those who have mistreated his people, who haven't listened to his laws, have went their own way, and many paths have went down that they really shouldn't have went down. He says he's going to deal with that, and it's a lot about judgment. And as you know, there's a lot of judgment throughout the books of the major prophets. But like I said before, it interspersed with love love stories how god has affection and deep care for his people and we just read about the last time god foreseen his people in a great place where they were singing songs of salvation where they were full of joy again because that's where he knew he was bringing them like we shared about yesterday but from isaiah 13 prophecy against babylon what god was going to do um how he was going to deal with that nation but we pick it up from verse nine and in nine it says see the day of the lord is coming a cruel day with wrath and fierce anger to make the land desolate and destroy the sinners within it the stars of heaven and their constellations will not show their light the rising sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light i will punish the world for its evil the wicked for their sins i'll put an end to the arrogance of the haughty and will humble the pride of the ruthless so that doesn't sound like good news at the minute. Verse 11 is specifically the verse that I'm thinking of, which for me is sandwiched in this chapter here, which is talking a lot about judgment 
And it really sums it up well. It sums up why is God doing this? What's in God's heart? Why would he treat his people like this? Why would he exact judgment on these other peoples? Why would he do these things that may at times seem even cruel? Well, he says why. He tells us why in verse 11. I'll punish the world for its evil, the wicked for their sins. That's a surprisingly good news. I'll get to why. Why? How can that be good news? How can that be something I would want to share? I don't know about you, but there's only one thing I can think of that, that's worse than a God who says, I will punish the world, I'll deal with the wicked for their sin. There's only one thing I can think of that might be worse than that, and that's the idea that, that God won't do that. That's the idea that no one will do that. What do I mean? What I mean is the idea that there's no judge of this earth, that people will never have to give an account to anyone when they die. That people lived whatever way they wanted on this life, whatever moral conduct they wanted to show one day to the next, they did it and they're not accountable to anyone. We look around, the, co the moral morality that we have is independent, subjective, and it doesn't really matter. The only other alternative to a God who would deal with and judge the world for the way it lived was that there's no God at all. Because of course this is quite unpopular today. But what that is, is essentially saying that there's no final end, no final judge for anyone. And then therefore, it doesn't really matter how you live. This is what's known as the moral argument. For me, as the years go by, probably one of the strongest arguments in favour of God that we have. I just had a conversation with a guy one time about believing in God. And I had a conversation trying to see what he thought. And I think he was a bit like, maybe, maybe not, not sure, doesn't seem to make that much difference probably slanting towards not maybe based on things he'd seen or heard and I was like well okay let me take that to its natural conclusion you therefore don't believe we're of any purpose no nah, probably not no reason value for being here probably not then there's no final judgment when we die yeah okay probably not and I'm like well okay well let's take that to its natural conclusion maybe it's around the time of Jimmy Savile a guy who was known for molesting many children abusing his position he died before this was really found out and that ever any recompense, he never had to suffer for anything he had done. I was like, well, him. And at the time, there was a young children had been beaten and murdered by their own parents. And we know all the details about what they had done to their own child. And when you hear them details, I asked them, okay, so these guys, Hitler even, let me be extreme. Because he's an individual who carried out unbelievable atrocities. He doesn't mean any judge either then. And at that moment, he's like, oh, that, that, that doesn't sit right with me. In other words, there can't be no judge for the world. We can't live whatever way we want in this lifetime and then think that nothing comes at the end of it all. What's to make us act anyway morally good? It's just a subjective decision that we make. And hence, the moral argument would say as well, if we all have a subjective view of what's right and wrong, then why do we go around holding everybody else to our standard? There's an accepted objective standard that we all sign up to just intuitively. Where'd that come from? Again, it's good news because it means that God will deal with the world. As I was growing up and I seen injustices, I seen bullying, I see it, I hear about it today. We hear about people doing things in the middle of this pandemic that we just cannot believe people trying to point score, people trying to make profiteering off this situation, even over in Northern Ireland, some criminality that you hear about and you're thinking, really, at this time, there must be a judge. There must be someone that will hold people to account for how they live. So for me, God's going to judge the world. That's good news. There has to be someone. And it is. It's God. It's, it. it's him who will judge. So surprisingly good news. I said there was two things. So that's the first thing. And it's again, it's known as the moral argument. I can give a lot more about that in the future. And it is an apologetic type argument. The second thing as to why this is good news is because as Christians, we're on the right side. So this is the natural outcome to everyone's life. Let me ask you a question. I ask myself this question. Have you ever done anything wrong? Have you ever known you've done anything wrong and still did it? Or known it was wrong and still did it? Have you ever known it was wrong and then repeated it again? Do you believe that there should be justice served for people who do wrong? 
the answer to all them questions is obviously going to be yes. We're all on the wrong side because we've all done things wrong. Different levels doesn't really matter that much. We live in a world where we have a judicial system. We operate with our children, with people in life. We're, there is a standard. And we all know that we've broken that standard, whether it be physical acts in our mind, not even in the past, but we probably all do it most days. So we are them people that God will judge as well. He will judge us also. But because of what God's done for us, we know we're going to be okay. We've got this intuition, this, this sixth sense, if you like, that we will have to give an answer for how we lived. So we know it's coming. But God stepped in and said, you don't have to worry. It's nothing you need to do to fix it. I'm going to make you right with me. I'm going to give you exactly what you need. It's like it happened in, throughout Isaiah. God said to the people, look, if you just stay or if you go when the right when people come, just go. Everything will be okay for you. Just follow my instructions. Listen to my prophets. Do what they ask you to do. If you listen to them, to me essentially, Things will work out for you, but if you do it your own way, it won't. It's exactly the same. God's like, look, I know you're sinners. I know you do wrong, but I've got a solution for you. I've got the perfect solution. You don't need to do anything. Really, you do none of it. It's not your work. You just need to obey and comply with what that what that is. And again, we know it's Jesus sent to die for us. All the things we've done wrong through our entire life have been washed away. We no longer need the answer for them. One of my favourite verses that sums that all up, which describes our position. So God not only takes away the sin that we would be judged for, the wrongdoing that we would be judged for, but he stamps us with something else. So that he doesn't look at us and see someone neutral of any sin, but he actually looks at us and sees people who are holy and blameless. We'll get there eventually here. Um, Ephesians chapter 1. And it says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. He chose us in him before the creation of the world, before we went wrong, to be holy and blameless in his sight. And he go on in love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ. It mentions the word Jesus Christ over and over and over again to remind us it's not our doing. But you know what? I've lifted you up, I've adopted you as my sons, you're no longer foreigners and aliens, and I've made you holy and blameless in my sight. God's saying, in my sight, you'll be holy and blameless. You've been washed of sin. So this is why I say surprisingly good news. It's surprisingly good news that God will one day hold the world to account for its sin. And unfortunately, punish the world for its sin we do not rejoice in that because we know we're fallen ourselves but it's surprisingly good news because it's great that someone is the judge and arbiter of all man and will decide that people need to be dealt with you cannot act whatever way you want in this life hurting people doing horrible terrible things and no one's going to hold you to account for it it's simply it's it's against all our own intuitions that something like that would happen so that's surprisingly good news that someone's there to hold people to account. And it's surprisingly good news because it means we're not on that side of judgment. It reminds us that although it's common, we've been washed free. We've been freed of our sins. We now no longer need to be guilty or held accountable for the things we've done wrong. This is incredible. I mean, Paul said it. There's now no, therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We know all that's common. We know we've done things that deserve death. We know we deserve to be on the wrong side of punishment. But it's all been washed away from us. So it's surprisingly good news to say this today. Um, so I do hope we can meditate on that, that that does impact us. There again, explore the moral argument, a great argument in defense of, of God. Um, moral argument, look up moral obligation. There's incredible stuff. Some of the stuff on my site may drop in a link on that as well. Um, and also, as I say, just to be so grateful um, as you take bread and wine tomorrow in communion, just to be so grateful that we are on the right side of judgment. It's a reminder of what will happen, but God has given us the perfect solution. So, um, yeah, maybe a little bit, but normal time today really, as it turns out, um, once you get started. But anyway, great to have you tuned in today. 
And um, please just um, like and subscribe to the YouTube channel, That, that Bible Guy. Hook on to WordPress as well, prepare the answer, but wordpress.com. Thanks for tuning in today. We're with you all again, hopefully tomorrow. Um, and I keep hope my Wi-Fi stays um, true and works. Thanks and God bless.